In the 19th century, science and the scientific method was becoming more and more normalized to the general population, and that development paved the way for the work of Charles Darwin, whose work marked a significant evolution Pun intended. in scientific studies. So we're going to talk about his work in this video and the impact it had on social structures. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, survival of the fittest style, let's get to it. So let me begin by introducing you to my boy, Charles Darwin. He was an Englishman who gained a theological education at Cambridge University, but he also had a deep interest in geology. And so in order to scratch that itch, he volunteered for a scientific expedition expedition sponsored by the British Royal Navy. Now, the mission of this expedition was to study plant and animal life in the Pacific and South America. And to his great pleasure, Darwin was able to study plants and animals and land masses that were basically as they were when the good Lord flung them into existence from the moment of creation. But the more he studied and observed, the more that good Lord and creation bit seemed to crumble away. You see, according to the Old Testament book of Genesis, God had created the world and all that existed out of nothing in six days. Humans were made out of dirt as fully formed adults as were the trees and the rivers and the animals. Now, to be fair, almost no one in the church in terms of the six days of creation literally up to this point. It was only after Darwin's work that such an interpretation would become popular. But what everyone in the church basically agreed on is that no matter how long creation actually took, that was immaterial. What mattered is that God had engaged in a special act of creation, and that is where everything came from. But as Darwin began studying the natural world and its processes in these remote locations, he began to doubt that God had created the universe in a special act of divine power. Rather, he observed that species evolved over time in response to their changing environment. So Darwin argued in his book On the Origin of species that plant and animal species evolved by means of natural selection, which is to say that weaker species who did not adapt would die out and stronger species that did adapt would survive, which is why this view is summarized as survival of the fittest. Now, as I said, in his first book, Darwin only applied this theory to plants and animals, and the church was like, Okay. But then in 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man, which applied the principles of evolution and natural selection to the human race, suggesting that humans themselves had evolved from lower forms of animals. To which the church was like, <laughs> Ultimately, though, despite some initial pushback, Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection was gradually accepted by much of the wider public. But it was the application of Darwin's theory to social structures where things started getting a little cool. So in the second half of the 19th century, some people began applying the principles of organic evolution to the social order, which came to be known as social Darwinism. And the name to recognize here is Herbert Spencer. He was a British philosopher who argued that just as organisms evolved over time and just as strong organisms adapted and survived while weaker organisms died out, so civilizations were like organisms too. Strong societies were the ones that adapted and thrived, while weak societies were destined to fade under the principle of natural selection. In other words, in the social realm, just like in the biological realm, only the fittest survive. Now think about who he was and when in history he was saying these things. Spencer was a British philosopher living in the glory days of British industrial world dominance. So clearly, by Spencer's reasoning, Britain had all the proper characteristics that made it fit for survival, while those places they conquered under the aegis of their growing empire were weaker and therefore, by the law of nature, were not fit to survive. Therefore, if survival of the fittest was the essential law of nature, why would anyone have any moral objections to strong societies eating weak societies? You can kind of see where this goes a little sideways. And so when social Darwinism was adopted by nationalists, it had some dire consequences. For example, in Germany, Houston Stuart Chamberlain, who was actually British but became a German citizen, applied social Darwinism to the German people. He argued that Germans were the pure ancestors of the Aryans who were the true genesis of Western culture. And therefore, the Aryan race should prepare itself to fight against and eliminate the influences of lesser races like Jews, Asians, and Africans. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because it's an idea that the racialist herd Adolf Hitler would embrace later, but we'll save that for the next year. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 7 of AP European History. And then click here to grab my AP Euro Review Pack, which will help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.